Marsha Eli, who many of you who are followers of um, this series know, um, has long been at the Brooklyn Historical Society and now is part of the BPL Presents team, um, which is part of this combination um, that we've been working on. In addition to combining the collections of the uh, Brooklyn Public Library with the Historical Society collections, which has not been an easy task, but we're through that. Um, we've been working on combined programming and also on reopening the Pierpont Street building uh, this fall. And so we're hard at work at that, and we hope that you will um, be there to uh, celebrate that opening with us when we're ready. In the meantime, at least for the moment, the building is being used as a place to pick up and drop off books while we're waiting to reopen the Brooklyn Heights Library, which um, is scheduled for this spring. So that's, uh, we have a lot of really exciting things to look forward to. Uh, but thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, I can't wait to hear what the panelists have to say, but first we're gonna hear a little bit from Marsha. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Linda. And thank you all for being here. As Linda said, I'm Marcia Eli of um, the Center for Brooklyn History and BPL Presents. And um, tonight's program is, is part of a series uh, uh, that the Center for Brooklyn History is presenting called Out of the Box. Briefly, BPL's 125th provides an opportunity for us to recognize all that the library does and celebrate that. And one very important part of that work, as Linda mentioned, is stewarding the extraordinary collections, special collections, really, I should say, at the Center for Brooklyn History. Um, these archives are combined materials, as Linda said, and together, BPL's collections and the former Brooklyn Historical Society's collections are literally, literally the most comprehensive, comprehensive collection of Brooklyn-related materials in the world, in the universe, I'll say. So um, 1,200 collections, 33,000 books, 1,200 oral histories, 50,000 photographs, 2,000 maps, and on and on. So we're celebrating these collections, putting them center stage, by focusing on a few as springboards for discussion. Last week we explored Pete Hamill's papers, coming up our programs on our Dodgers collections and our vast materials related to Brooklyn's civil rights. And tonight's program is inspired by a truly important and unique collection with deep material on the history of community development movements. The Ronald Schiffman Collection on the Pratt Center for Community Development. It contains, yes. It contains 60 years, 60 plus years of items of all kinds that pull back the curtain on organizing and community empowerment in Brooklyn and beyond. These papers provide case study after case study on building multi-racial, multicultural, economically diverse neighborhoods, and by extension, building an equitable, inclusive, and democratic society. I want to thank our partners, the Pratt Graduate Center for Planning and the Environment, and the Pratt Center for Community Development for joining us in presenting this evening. I want to welcome Francis Bonet, president of Pratt, who is here with us this evening. Uh, and I also want to invite all of you to share your questions tonight. Write them on the index cards that you were given at the, at the door, and our ushers will collect them uh, through the program. So uh, in a moment, I'm excited to bring up a truly extraordinary and distinguished panel. But first, here is a brief presentation, an overview of the collection presented by my former colleague, the person who had the privilege of processing this collection, Maggie Schreiner, who was a former archivist at Center for Brooklyn History. Maggie. Hi, 
everyone. So as Marcia mentioned, I'm Maggie Schreiner. I'm really happy to be with here, with, here with you today to give an overview of the Ronald Schiffman Collection on the Pratt Center for Community Development. Um, in my previous work at Brooklyn Historical Society, I worked with Ron to bring the materials uh, to BHS, the Center for Brooklyn History, and to pre prepare the materials for researchers. So in almost 150 boxes of material, the collection documents the broad scope of Ron Schiffman's career and the Pratt Center's work from the 1960s to the present. The collection is a really rich source of material on community-based planning, participatory and advocacy planning, self-help and sweat equity, housing programs and policies, community development corporations, and land use in Brooklyn, across New York City, and internationally. I'm going to give you the next few minutes giving you a sense of the incredible breadth and depth of materials in the collection. So the Pratt Center for Community Development was founded in 1963 as a training and capacity building program, working with community-based organizations to challenge systemic inequalities and advance equitable and sustainable development. As part of the Pratt Institute, the center has historically provided skills in urban planning, architecture, design, and public policy. In 1965, Ron Schiffman assisted the Central Brooklyn Coordinating Council and Senator Robert F. Kennedy to conceive and launch the first community development corporation, known today as the Bedford-Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation. Since the 1960s, Bed-Stuy Restoration has focused on the rehabilitation of housing, facilitated mortgage financing, and aided community investments and job creation. You can see on the left of the screen one of the earliest proposals for the creation of the Bed-Stuy Restoration Corporation, dating from around 1966, and on the right, a 10-year anniversary publication from 1977. In addition to the wealth of materials about Bed-Stuy restoration, the collection also documents the establishment and development of Community Development Corporation model as a whole. On this slide, you can see a newsletter from Bed-Stuy Youth in Action, an agency founded in the mid-1960s to develop youth services programming in Bed-Stuy. In addition to the Youth in Action material contained in the Ron Schiffman collection, the Center for Brooklyn History also has an additional collection of material documenting this organization, gathered by a former board member. Additional community development projects represented in the collection include those in Crown Heights, Greenpoint, Essex Street Market, Cooper Square, and other locations across the city. Community planning is also a major topic represented, including materials both for and in opposition to major redevelopment projects throughout New York City. These projects include the redevelopment of Lower Manhattan and Chinatown after September 11th, as well as the redevelopment of Greenpoint and Williamsburg, and other redevelopment uh, projects such as those in Red Hook, the Guanas Canal, Atlantic Yards, and Columbia University's expansion. These projects are represented through materials such as strategic plans, outreach materials, meeting notes, correspondence, and planning documents. And of course, there's incredible visual materials such as this comic strip from 1992 about Greenpoint Williamsburg. Another example is this report from 1996 about Red Hook. And there are also materials representing more recent projects such as the rebuilding of Coney Island following Hurricane Sandy. So the Pratt Center formed alliances and worked in collaboration with city, state, and national entities focused on community empowerment and engagement. At the city level, the Pratt Center worked in collaboration with ANHD, the Association of Neighborhood Housing Developers, UHAB, the Urban Homesteading Assistance Board, the New York City Housing and Community Development Coalition, known now as the Housing Justice Campaign, and on this slide, you can see an invitation to UHAB's 50, 15th anniversary celebration in 1984, as well as a more recent publication from the year 2000. At the state level, the Pratt Center was allied with the New York State Housing and Tenants Association, and at the federal level with the Center for Community Change and the National Low Income Housing Coalition. These relationships together constituted the community-based housing and community development movements in which local knowledge, technical assistance, regional initiatives, and federal policies, public policy functioned in mutually in a multi-directional exchange. And here you can see materials from the Association of Neighborhood Housing Developers dating from 1985. 
The collection also includes numerous publications documenting the work of the Pratt Center and the community-based housing and community development movements, such as the Pratt Center Community Information Bulletins, published to alert the community to developments in urban renewal, housing, and planning. And you can see here an issue from February 1972. The collection also includes Street Magazine, published during the 1970s by the Pratt Center, and early issues of City Limits, which was founded in 1976 as a newsletter for New York City's housing rehabilitation movement. City Limits brought together content from the newsletters of individual organizations, including the Pratt Center, the Urban Homesteading Assistance Board, and the Association of Neighborhood and Housing Developers. The combined newsletters expanded to a monthly magazine, as you can see here in a bright pink issue from January 1982. A really special part of the project of the collection is materials related to Building Hope, the Community Development Oral History Project. So this project was funded by the Ford Foundation and conducted interviews with leaders from 19 community development corporations across the country. In addition to project planning, financial and outreach materials, the collection includes the audio recordings and transcripts from the interviews conducted during this project, which are in the process currently of being digitized. These interviews form an incredibly rich source of material for understanding the history and evolution of community development across the country. The collection also documents numerous other projects undertaken or supported by the Pratt Center for a span of over 40 years. One of these focuses was supporting the organization of daycares for low and middle income families demonstrated through this manual and other organizational records supporting environmentalism and parks in New York City. And finally, the Pratt Center's work on brownfields, in particular collaboration with European colleagues to develop strategies for remediating contamination and redeveloping these sites. You can learn more about the Ronald Schiffman Collection on the Pratt Center for Community Development by following the short links on this slide. The first link is a guide to the collection, referred to as a finding aid in Archive Speak, that provides details for all the types of materials and topics represented in the collection. You can also, in the second link, find a guide to additional materials held by the Center for Brooklyn History on neighborhood change and gentrification. Materials related to today's conversation include the bed Restoration Corporation Oral History Collection, the Downtown Brooklyn Development Association records, the Eastern Parkway Coalition records, and many additional redevelopment proposals and plans. So you can visit the links to learn more about these materials and how to do research at the Center for Brooklyn History. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Maggie. And now um, I want to invite our panelists and moderator up to gather on the stage. It is truly my honor to welcome Ron Schiffman, Colvin Granham, come on up, Pat Swan, Ava Alligood, Eva Alligood, and our distinguished moderator, Michael Kimmelman. Thank you all so much for being here. And I'm not, not going to le read long bios because you have them and you'd much rather hear them in conversation. Hi, everyone. Um, isn't it nice to be in a room with other people as opposed to on Zoom? I don't know about you, but I was really looking forward to it just to sort of feel again to be in the presence of other people and have an actual conversation with living human beings in the flesh. First of all, let me just say, I'm sure on behalf of everyone here, congratulations, Ron, and, and thank you <laughs> for... So we're going to have a conversation that ranges widely, I think, and hopefully in a natural, rather improvisatory way. We're going to talk about community development. So let me begin by asking each of you, in turn, more or less, to describe what community means. I think I'll just prep it by saying, I think especially in areas like central Brooklyn, um, this is a complicated subject these days. It's not obvious. Obviously, the meaning of this term has changed in, over the years. 
Ron, let me, let me start with you. What is, what is the meaning of community? You want me to start? <laughs> well, the best definition I've ever heard is it's that line, if you have a qu cross, you get beat up. All right. Uh, but uh, we always, I, at least I always looked at it as something that the people who come to us define rather than my taking the responsibility of defining who the community is. And there obviously are a variety of communities that occupy the same space and, or allied spaces or connected spaces. So I would see it in that perspective. But while I have the mic, I have to say one thing, and that is it's the Ron Schiffman collection, but it's based on the work of a whole bunch of people. Every staff member, student, uh, colleague, many of whom may be here tonight, many of whom I know are not here, uh, that really is reflected in that collection. And I had the opportunity to work with some of the greatest folks around. And two of them are on the stage, three of them actually. Two worked with me directly, this guy recently. So it's a community that built a collection. It is a community collection. It's not an individual collection. Um, Eva, why don't you go next? Sure, thank you, Michael. Um, I think what I'll say is that community is about the social aspects of what connects people. So I think, um, as you can see from the presentation on the Pratt Center, a lot of the work was about rehabilitating physical spaces and making them habitable, uh, revitalizing housing, um, bringing about economic development and jobs and um, supports for youth. But I think at the heart of community, and I'll say, I'll kind of segue into what, how I define community development, mm -hmm. is it's about the civic connections that people build. And those are so important, and a lot of what this work started out as was a, a way to make sure those, um, that fabric of civic connection um, wasn't torn the way um, we saw it with bad urban planning and all the, all the things that the Pratt Center came about to fight um, urban renewal and all those things. So um, I think at the heart of community is people working in some sort of collective fashion and having a shared stake in their future. And um, I think that way of looking at it is very relevant to the birth of the movement as well as to today, most certainly today. Well, let's get back to today. Let me, let me ask you, Pat. <clears throat> So community can mean a lot of things now. You know, there's virtual communities, communities of constituencies. For me, in the context of community development, it's always grounded in a physical place. It could be a city, it could be a neighborhood, it could be a region. Um, but for me, community development is all about um, creating opportunities for people who have shared um, concerns and priorities because they live together in a physical place um, to have a voice in the decisions that are made that affect the quality of life in that community. So for me, it's always grounded in, in, in the physical place, which actually is a, is a little bit of a controversial um, notion these days in the community development field. Why so? Um, there are a lot of very effective strategies, organizations that are approaching the what they define as community development that's not bound necessarily by a physical space, but bound more by common needs or priorities of a constituency or a group of people or, you know, that kind of thing. And there's a place for that. It's great. It's wonderful. But, but for me, community development will always be grounded in a place. Well, we'll probe that a little more deeply, but Coben, since you run a community development organization, I that leave the last word anything. to you. Um, is this the bad mic? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, do I need to turn it off? Hello? Oh, yeah, there we go. This is, this is an interesting conversation because um, because the, the, I always say that the definition kind of has evolved and changed, right? So we're, co we're talking about the community development movement. It had everything to do with geography, but it also had everything to do with oppression and the factors that created community, right? There were certain things that 
whether it was disinvestment, poor education, crime, um, those were factors, and that, that remains true today. Like, they're, they're inputs that almost force people to join together to try and change their circumstance. And I grew up in Bedford-Stuyvesant in the 1950s and the 1960s. And people maybe who didn't have a whole lot of common, um, because they lived in a place that had been subject to disinvestment and neglect, came together, they had no real choice other than to come together to try and change their circumstance. So, you know, back then, Bedford-Stuyvesant and most of central Brooklyn was, and I say most, Ron, it was like over 90% African-American or people of African descent. And um, so they had that in common, but they also had a whole bunch of external factors that were affecting the quality of their life that they came together to try to change. And people were not helping them, so they needed to help themselves, is what you're suggesting. Correct. <clears throat> okay, but obviously we live in a very different moment than when you were growing up or when um, the restoration was created. How do you define the bed community now? Well, I, I, I am one who um, likes to use the term the incredible shrinking bed for Stuyvesant because um, when I grew up, Ron, I don't know if you remember this, but there were probably like 450,000 people in Bedford-Stuyvesant, and it was a label that was kind of, they were, when I grew up, look, I, I grew up in what's now called Clinton Hill. We didn't call it Clinton Hill when I grew up. You get beat up for calling it Clinton Hill. You either lived in Fort Greene, or you lived in Bed-Stuy, or you lived in Crown Heights, um, or you lived in Brownsville or Ocean Hill. Um, but my point is that back then, that term was used to denote wherever people of African descent was. It was another vehicle for redlining, right? So that's why I call it the incredibly shrinking bed style because um, now it's right back to whatever the designation was historically, um, and it's maybe 130,000 people as opposed to when restoration was working, it was dealing with hundreds of thousands of people. So the community has evolved a lot. Um, and obviously there are communities within the community, right? And so while things have changed, some things have remained the same. And so for some populations, um, they're still fighting for access to quality education. They're still fighting issues related to police brutality. And they're coming together around those issues not everybody in the geography shares the concern or shares the experience. And it, it does make for a bit more fracturing um, when it comes to dealing with different issues. So you're putting that in a very tactful way? <clears throat> that is my job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Pat sent me some recent census figures which showed, interestingly, that the African-American population in the city has declined, um, which is, I think, very significant and maybe reflects something of what you're talking about as well in the changing demographics of, of Bed-Stuy and Central Brooklyn too. Pat, what, are the, what do you think the consequences? First of all, why do you think that's happening? And, and what are the consequences of that? obviously on communities like those in central Brooklyn? Oh gosh, the why is, is a multi-layered answer. I think part of it is um, that, uh, I mean, this is the issue that everybody's worried about and concerned about, I think, across all kinds of economic levels, is housing is not available, and it, when it is available, it's not affordable. Um, for people who were fortunate enough, African-American families, to actually own their homes, the incredible appreciation and value um, for many is a temptation that many, um, that many succumb to, to, to sell out and leave New York City and go live someplace where they can have a quality of life much higher than, than you know, what they're paying for here. Um, I think that um, in some respects it's uh, ironically 
a function of the success of community development organizations that have worked so hard over the years to, um, to bring, you know, better schools, better, better commercial services, better police protection in some cases, and all kinds of, you know, positive things to communities that were basically left for dead in the 70s. And so as these communities improved, they became attractive to other people and other, you know, to white people and, and so forth. And so in a, in a very ironic way, um, you know, to some extent, the loss of black, black population is a function of that. Um, so, it, but, and I could go on, but it's, it's a multi-layered question, I'm sure. <clears throat> yeah, Ron, you look like you're looking at me like you want to say something, so you should. I just wanted to set a context, and that was when we first started working in Bed-Stuy, there was no congressional district that represented that 450,000 people. There was only one African-American congressperson from New York, and that was Adam Clayton Powell in Harlem. And one of the thing, first things we did at the request of the Central Brooklyn Coordinating Council, at the request of uh, the National Women's College Group, I forget their exact name, and a couple of others, was to help them make the argument for a district because in 1960, the census uh, led to a federal court decision of one person, one vote. And so one of the first things we worked on is how do you redistrict? Because what creates a community that's divided is a powerless community, and that's the point that Colvin was making. And this community was powerless because it was not only divided congressionally, it was divided uh, on a city level and on a state level, so it had no political power. The first congressperson from this area was Shirley Chisholm. And uh, Shirley was one of the people we worked with from the first day on. So it, it and you know, she was, she was a great person to work with, but it was a lot of the women in Bedford-Stuyvesant that organized to create the, div the framework for the changes that are taking place. You know, I, I just want to quickly say, because it just occurs to me that um, it is not a happenstance that, uh, that in a way, uh, Brooklyn became the birthplace of the community development movement. Pratt Center, the Pratt Institute was smack dab in Fort Greene, right? And uh, Fort Greene was a mess, just like people, you know, when I grew up, <laughs> bed Stuys got the moniker for being like the worst place in Brooklyn or the toughest, but Fort Greene was no joke, right? Am I, am I kidding? No. Not at all. Right. It was no joke. Um, and, but the Pratt Center was there. And the Pratt Center lent its resources, its talent, its commit, you know, to um, organizations in Brooklyn. And so I just want to commend the Platt Center uh, because it, I don't think it would have happened the way it happened if the Platt Center wasn't sitting in the heart of a very tough urban community. So the Platt Center was crucial to being part of the community essentially. So the community was in included Platt is what you're saying. Well, you, the, the community surrounded Platt, right? right. And Pratt, instead of running away, and yeah. went out into the community th yeah. through the Pratt Center and other initiatives to you know, lend its resources and talent. Yeah. Well, Pratt did want to leave, you know. <laughs> it did. They did, and we helped organize against it. I almost got fired. Uh, there were some... Okay, it wasn't the Pratt Center. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the Pratt Institute. <laughs> but there were some folks at Pratt, uh, particularly Richardson Pratt and a number of others uh, that realized it's important to stay. And he also, there's somebody in the audience who he brought on to be on the board, Michael Pratt, who really lent a lot in supporting not only what we were doing, but what dozens of community-based organizations in Brooklyn were supporting. And if, if I could just point out that um, there are lots of examples of institutions of higher education and other types of institutions in the middle of neighborhoods like Bed-Stuy that haven't done what the yeah. Pratt Center or Pratt Institute did. And I think um, the thread that I want to pull out what um, Ron and Colvin were just talking about 
is really important when you think about the history of community development. It's that dimension of politics and representation, and that is really essential. And that was um, sort of baked into the model right from the start, is um, if, you don't, if you don't have power to make change, if you don't have, if you don't have a place to even put your um, pressure, then you're not gonna get what you need to have a decent quality of life. And so I think that's something, again, that's really critical to today to how we should look at community development. So I asked the question in the beginning about a community because obviously the, we, this, is a, this is a contested issue these days. We have neighborhoods which are like ben Stuy, which are increasingly diverse, but of course also have increasing wealth gaps and not just bed of course. Um, and we have um, communities that are divided around their interests. I, you know, look, I, I write about um, issues around development often, and I'm increasingly struck by how changes over the course of the time we've been talking about, since the 60s, created often in a spirit of progressive and socially minded um, progress, just in general, <laughs> um, have shifted. So some of those include issues around preservation, housing preservation, some of them issues around environmental laws that were created. So often these, these policies, and you talk about political representation, we also live in a period of gerrymandering. Um, I just, I'm really, I think somehow at the heart of the issue of community development is this larger question of how community development can work to improve the lives of those people who are most underserved and around which community development was created um, at a time when many of these processes and, and um, even laws were enacted years ago that have now very different effects and the problems are huge and quite different than they were, whether they're environmental ones or even including political ones. So I don't, I don't want to dilly-dally too much longer in the wonders of community development. I, I want to dig a little deeper into some of the challenges that we face now. I think they're, they're big and, and really Terrifying. I may have pushed us off the question of where are all the black people going. Um, so we should probably go back there, sure. right? And, um, and I couple it with the question of what is happening to middle class in New York, period, mm -hmm. right? So part of, at least as I understand it, and Ron can shed some light on this, a part of also what also made Bedford Stuyvesant work as a place to really launch a robust community development effort was that it had a significant, it had a relatively high percentage of African American home ownership, right? And um, and 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 that was important because obviously to the extent that people own, they have a deep stake and a commitment to trying to improve, even if it's just, I just want to see the value of my home improve, but it goes much deeper than that. And so as, as home ownership has declined, not just in Bedford Stuyvesant, but across the nation for people of color, right? Because the home ownership rate in the nation today is lower than it was in the 1960s, right? So um, what I would say is the city needs to do more and so does the federal government, around helping people build wealth in a very intentional way. And it's not, it's, it's people of color, but it's everybody, right? Because um, I think that my personal view and the view that I bring to restoration is that mixed income communities are healthy. And we made a mistake in creating a lot of economic, polar, uh, geographical, polarization economically. So, for example, what I mean by that is that in communities, whether it's Fort Greene or Bedford-Stuyvesant or Brownsville, there are places where there's just density of low income, which is distinct from what's in the um, lower density brownstone community. And so you get a place like uh, 
of Fort Greene, if you look at the diversity index, it's going to be really high, but you're not going to, it's not really integrated, right? It's just, there's the, 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 the public housing and then there's the more affluent portion. Um, so I just think that we have to be far more intentional around issues related to race and to wealth creation. Um, and we have to recognize that there are weaknesses in our current free market system that we have to address in an intentional way. Um, black folks are leaving not just voluntarily, but they're also leaving because they were the target of predatory lending right after the um, Great Recession or during the Great Recession. And so we lost tr billions of dollars of equity and that was intentional discrimination focused on people of color who were moderate income, who were homeowners. So we have people who are striving to do the right thing, to own, and who become victims. Deed theft has been concentrated in communities of color. So there are racial dynamics that are driving people out that we don't address, deed theft, all these other kind of you know, predatory lending. And then there's the kind of stuff that Pat mentioned, where if a, if a, home, if a, if a household is earning $110,000 in New York City, they can't buy anything. And they, if they have the skills, they just pick up. And whether they own a home or not, you know, Atlanta seems like a better option, or Raleigh, or something of that nature. I think you said to me earlier, remind me of this, that a third of the African-American population in the country has either zero, zero or negative net worth. Zero or negative net worth. And that number is expected to rise to at least 50%. By 2060. Yeah. So maybe another way of asking this is, because I was in my rambling remark a moment ago, I was suggesting that there were a lot of things we did over a period of time, or didn't do over these periods of decades, which created a situation which has actually exacerbated the wealth gap. and created greater fears, I think, about displacement. I, I, I don't like the word gentrification because I personally think the real issue is, is fears of displacement, fears of losing one's ability to stay in a neighborhood or maintain one's business in a neighborhood. But whatever it is, I think those problems are as bad as, as they've ever been. And, and we did many things over these decades. Um, we failed, for instance, Ron, and we were talking about this earlier. We failed when, we, when there was city-owned land to think ahead. You were thinking about banking land. The city was trying to just get whatever money it could by selling land to landlords. Now there's very little or virtually none available on which to build affordable housing that makes it economically possible, or, or also to provide people with land in order to build their own wealth. The reality was in the late 60s and through the 70s, we were losing about between 30 to 36,000 units of housing a year. That doesn't mean they were totally disappearing, but owners were walking away from them. The city had a huge in-rem housing stock. And they were walking away, just, just to be clear, because I think not everybody here will remember that moment. Yeah. That, that, that was bec they were walking away from properties because the properties were valueless, right? Yes, or they were afraid of maintaining the building. Uh, and, uh, you know, I once described it as five family, five 20 family units a day, a, a day being demolished. And, and I said at that time, if a foreign enemy were bombing those, we'd, re we'd mobilize all our resources to address that enemy. That enemy at that time was redlining. That enemy at that time was insurance redlining. It was racial discrimination. It was a whole set of different factors that came together. So part of what we talk about community development has to be place-based, but part of it has to be issue-based. Mm -hmm. And how do we really garner the political power to have had in the city the brains to land bank that for public purposes? We had a, a, a housing commissioner at that time who said, well, New York City is shrinking, and that by 
1983, Roger Starr basically wrote an article in the New York Times saying New York City would have a population of 5,300,000 by this time. And we're closer to oh, well over 8 million. And so what we have to begin is to develop not only the policies and the programs, but a vision of what we want to accomplish in the future. And I don't think that's been there. And I don't think we had the power, even though many of us were arguing. And it wasn't just the Pratt Center. There were groups being led out of Washington, D.C. by the Center for Community Change, uh, the people's welfare rights movements, all talking about how do you build wealth in the black community. It's not something new. There, there may have been different approaches, but it was constantly being pushed back. It was constantly being rejected because that political power base didn't exist. I, I want to pick up on the, the vision plus political power and push back a little bit, Michael, on your comment that there's no, you know, unfortunately we're not back in the bad old 70s and so there's no, um, no properties to, to, you know, try to, with vision and political power, put towards addressing affordable housing and the racial equity gap. And my pushback is to point out one example. There are many, but I'll just point to one. Hudson Yards, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, was a wasteland of, you know, abandoned, well, <laughs> it's, a, it's a different kind of wasteland now. And, Billions, billions, billions of dollars have been invested in creating a community there. For who? For who? And so I kind. This is a city where you know when when there was land needed for to extend Manhattan out into the bay, we just created land. I mean, this is a city where um, possibilities are limited only by imagination and political will. I understand there's lots of challenges. You know, the environmental challenges and, and issues are, are certainly, you know, to the fore right now. But still, let's not just accept that, oh, well, too bad there's no more in-rem, you know, buildings, and so I guess we can't do anything about the housing crisis. No, there's, there's ways. There's create, creative ways with vision and political power to, to make it happen. I, I, I want to echo what Pat just said, and, and, and also I think um, I, I, I would shy away from um, us looking at this work and saying, well, you know, we somehow didn't accomplish what we wanted to in the sense that now, now we look at the results and they're not where we want to be. And, um, and somehow that's the fault of the people who were doing the work of rebuilding affordable housing or organizing tenants and all the things that we've talked about. I think um, you know, the point is that there are larger systemic issues mm -hmm. that are at play um, that are in constant need of analysis and breaking down and sort of um, challenge in order to get beyond them. So I, I, you know, I think that the tools, they need to be freshened and, and uh, re-looked at and with every iteration of what our urban landscape looks like and our um, urban conditions. But um, I think at the heart is this notion that through collective action um, that is focused not just on physical space, but all the other things we've been talking about, the need um, to look at wealth building, um, economic development, jobs, um, better schools, all of those things, they're a fight, they're an ongoing fight. And just because we haven't won that fight or we look at certain neighborhoods and we say, well, look who's benefiting from that now, that means we lost. No, it means that we need to spread those benefits more evenly and we have to make sure that people are not pushed out when those conditions be get better. I think that is a critical issue for New York City and other urban areas is um, how do you enable the people who stuck it out during really bad times. How do they benefit from that growth and prosperity that's brought by development um, and all those improvements? And again, I get back to um, us not losing sight of it's a power fight, it's advocacy, it's mm -hmm. organizing, combined with really deep knowledge of how land use works 
um, combined with making sure you have elected officials that um, have to answer to you and all those things. So I, I just think that though that's still at the heart of what we need to be doing. Yeah. You know, one of the most contentious issues um, in the housing today is height and density, right? And um, you know, my point of view was that we need both, right? My point of view is that low density communities tend to um, exclude lower income folks, um, whether it's Brooklyn Heights or Parsbeck Heights or now Bedside. Um, and but and so you need density, and I believe in mixed income buildings that have density and height. But there's a lot of pushback on that, even from people who believe in the importance of affordable housing. We do have a finite amount of, and I don't know where Ron stands on this, because I think it's a complicated issue, so part of this is to get him to say something. Um, <laughs> but, um, right, so I'm a proponent of mixed income, taller buildings. I believe in a living city. I'm not so much an adherent to uh, contextual this and contextual that. I mean, I have respect for what was done in the past, but if it's not serving us today, I'm like, let's get rid of it. So when I'm, you know, Thanksgiving, we have arguments about whether you should be able to see a building from Prospect Park. I'm like, yes. And others are like, no, because the park was designed so that you would never see a building from it. I'm like, that's the past. Um, I just think we need to make this city work for everybody. And we, to Pat's point, we have to innovate in ways that we haven't done in the past. We have to think out of the box about how to create opportunities. And we have to understand that the city was designed to work for the people who were there when it was created, whatever it was at the 1800s or the 1700s. And to the extent that we hold on to all of those things, and I know we want to cherish certain architectural features and other historic things, but they should not trump the current needs of a diverse population, economic and racially diverse population. I happen to agree with Colvin's last statement, but I don't agree with everything you said. And the re Just and the focus re on the part you don't agree with. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason for that is that I think we need to build at appropriate densities. What is the carrying capacity of that land that surrounds it? Uh, what are the qualities of that land? Uh, and I think it's really important that we look at it from that perspective uh, and realize that, we, that density could be high density, low rise housing. There's somebody in the audience who developed the model for that. And I think we could really do that and create much more livable communities. There are proposals for parts of Williamsburg where there will be buildings now that are supported by some of the groups that are in the room, by the way, uh, that will create a dynamic in that community that families will not remain. It will, it's just going to create the kind of density and the height that will cast shadows literally over the community and its future. And I think what we have to do is begin to think, how do we design the best communities? How do we make sure we build wealth for people, not necessarily if they are built on real estate alone. There are ways of doing that, and we have to think about wealth building as part of housing strategies, but absent of housing strategies. We've got to start thinking about place-based clients, but also uh, uh, clients that are advocates for low-cost housing, uh, or clients that are there for uh, environmental justice and climate justice issues, because all of these things weave into what create the healthy communities of the future. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> applaud that, uh, Ron. I, I, I think one thing we haven't touched on yet today and in terms of why we're dealing with these land pressures and the skyrocketing costs of housing is the exclusionary zoning that takes place in the suburbs right outside of New York City's boundaries. And that is a huge reason why also we even have to look at this uh, crazy amount of building that has to happen in a very concentrated area. So I think um, one thing that, in terms of looking at the vision of what needs to happen um, in the next phase of pushing for change in this field is really um, finding strategies that work 
to um, increase density in the suburbs and, and, and really fight exclusionary zoning and allow for more um, okay. housing and di a, di a diverse range of people to live in, in all communities in this. But I remember when we had to fight the city of New York because they were coming into the communities and lowering the densities, building uh, single family housing in the South Bronx that had an infrastructure that could carry a great, uh, greater density. So I think we have to begin to take a look at the areas that have the real carrying capacity. I think what Brad Lander's done along the Gowanus Canal and the negotiations and working with the community there to both build the housing, to work on how you create mixed income housing in that community, as well as working with the school district to make sure it's integrated. Not just people there being measured in numbers, but how the programmatic aspects of that education take place. So we have to think beyond just housing and how we really build communities. I mean, <clears throat> Can I just say, I, I think this is, of course, true. People don't live someplace because they just want a house. They want, a, <clears throat> they want a neighborhood. They want all the things that go along with and that you need, schools and shops and streets and parks. And, <clears throat> and this idea that somehow every, you can silo these different things, like the concerns around housing, is one of the most destructive elements about our thinking uh, in terms of development. But, but I think you're also, I mean, it's my job here to give some pushback. So look, we also live at a time, let's face it, when you have tremendous resistance to any kind of development, getting anything meaningful done in this city has become highly problematic. And, it's, and you have alliances that strike me as being very new and quite dangerous. Alliances of NIMBYs, um, wealthy NIMBYs, often with representatives of underserved communities who fear displacement. And this is an unusual situation in which when we need housing and certain kinds of development, you have essentially from both sides resistance to almost anything. And I'm sure everybody here has examples of this. Um, you have, you know, questions around historic preservation coming up against questions of equity in almost every neighborhood, like Bed-Stuy, where you have large amounts of significant... I mean, it's not that... There's no easy solution to this. I think one of the points that you're raising, Pat and, and Eva, is also that these are evolving systems. <clears throat> questions of community development have to evolve as the, as the systems change and as we create different neighborhoods. But the system we have at the moment creates a Hudson Yards but it, it is not creating anything like the amount of affordable housing we have. I'm looking at homelessness now, we have 35,000 homeless people in the city and a multi-billion dollar shelter system that doesn't house a single person. So clearly we're not moving ahead and we have something here that we have to deal with. Let me, let me just say one more thing along the lines because we don't have a lot of time and I want to open this up to questions. <clears throat> so, 500,000 people live in public housing in New York. The system is terribly broken. Um, we have proposals for how to improve some of that housing. And I raise this just as an example of some of the resistance. One of these proposals is called RAD, which uh, in New York's case involves bringing in private developers, nonprofits and for-profits to work for NYCHA, essentially. NYCHA maintains ownership of the property and ultimate control. But um, to, to essentially run those properties, to do renovations. There's enormous resistance to this in many places. We can talk about how successful or not some of these things are, but we often get a, a system that's stalled because the public conversations around these issues are hijacked. And the result is that people living in, under, you know, in, in poor conditions are not getting those conditions improved. So again, I'm sorry for laying this all out there, but I don't want us to just sort of leave it out here that we just have to try harder and think. We, the, the, we have big problems here. We have to really deal with this in some meaningful, tangible way. If I could say two things on that point, um, I'm very involved in that um, particular um, program called PACT. 
part yep. by um, New, New York City Housing Authority, um, <clears throat> in 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 a way dealing with um, some of the things you're talking about. Um, and what I say, I am um, talking about the role that I play at, at List New York City, which is um, where I work as deputy director. Um, the reason I mention this is that uh, a lot of the issues are around information and trust, um, and that and so to your point about civic discourse and being able to um, have people engage in some sort of conversation where they can weigh the pros and cons of a particular proposal and um, weigh in in a way that at the ultimately hopefully won't make everyone happy but will will lead to some improvement in quality of life or um, one of the outcomes in, in yep. terms of NYCHA is, is saving buildings that are literally falling apart. Um, the, the important thing here is that tool of bringing trusted information and actual facts about um, what is being proposed and also being um, having a forum where uh, things can be challenged and, and debated, uh, but in a way where uh, there are uh, sort of neutral parties that to some extent can at least offer up what the options are and explain the process, which is again sort of the origins of advocacy planning was all about bringing information to people because a lot of these processes are obtuse for a reason. Um, they're complicated and they get very technical and they get manipulated and, and um, they get gamed by those who have all the lawyers who can go through that. I mean, is this, I'm, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but COVID, is this then something that, that trust, that sense that the community is hearing from people who it can trust, that is, I assume, a fundamental role of an organization like yours, to act as an agent of good information to, that the community... Yeah, well, yeah, yes, but we're not always seen as trustworthy, um, to be honest with you, Yeah. right? And you want to say something? Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> the way we got started was uh, a group of ministers from Bed-Stuy yeah. wanted to we're afraid that a lot of the middle-income families would move because of the civil rights movement that was taking place. Uh, and so they were concerned about their congregations. What happened was uh, they were the ones who asked us to come in. When we came in, we were blasted. Why were we there? Everybody in the community was referring to uh, urban renewal, which was pr being proposed for parts of that community. Uh, as Negro removal, using the terminology of that time, and people were afraid. The meetings I went to initially were uh, just people screaming, and screaming based on real facts and, and, and experiences. What we did is we worked with them, and the people who actually challenged us the most, we took them to various different places to begin to see what alternatives were available, what was the best way of doing things. And after about a year, they came up with their own plan for renewal. Everybody turned them down because they didn't have the political power. But eventually, they got through one member of the City Planning Commission an agreement not an agreement, a, a, a link to Bobby Kennedy. It wasn't started by Bobby Kennedy. It was the men and women of Bed-Stuy working and organizing that met for about a year with an idea for the comprehensive renewal of the community where they wanted it renewed. They wanted it built. They wanted it to be better schools. They wanted all of those things. They came up with that plan. Kennedy came in because of the high rate of home ownership, saw so the area had good bones, to use a phrase my wife always talks about. And it really had good bones, and you could invest in it. And he then worked with the community after about six months of negotiations to let him come in because people were afraid of being used. But it's perseverance. It's a, I referred to what was going on in Gowanus. It's not favored by everyone, but it was a three to four year planning effort and people bought into it. And I think that's the issue. Trust the people in the community that we, if you work with them that the, and, and, and talk to them reasonably, that eventually you will bring about. And, and listen. I yeah, so I, I was, I was, a, I set you up for that, right? <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's my job. Um, one of the things I want to say is a tr so-called trusted institution has to earn its trust every day, every project. It's not sticky. And, um, and so to the point about the, the RAD, the Rental Assistance Demonstration Program, 
you know, our organization is involved in at least one of those. And um, when we go into those things, we know that a lot of the tenants are not in favor and that our job is to do exactly what Eva just said, is to earn their trust. And it's an ongoing process, so we never take it for granted. I'm going to ask some questions because um, there's just so much to talk about, but I want to make sure we get to some. Um, so here's one. How can we improve food deserts um, in places like East New York? Food is one of these issues now that um, I think um, there's, a, there's a whole movement, a lot of it driven by um, black African-American community leaders around healthy food. And um, if ever there was an opportunity for building wealth, you know, I believe that there is a lot, um, a lot of potential in terms of supporting and nurturing and, and, and promoting and giving all kinds of interest, infrastructure support, the same kind of things we do for housing to people who are trying to build food businesses. And I know Eva's been um, at the core of a lot of that um, work at LISC. And so, um, so I, I've just seen an incredible amount of energy, enthusiasm, expertise, and commitment around food. Um, the pandemic only made it even more more intensive. But it is but it is very hard to get say a supermarket in a poor neighborhood because supermarkets are loath to they work on slim margins and they, what was that program that had started years ago and didn't really go? Kathy Goldman at the Food Resource Community Food Resource. Uh, had a program too. Fresh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, the first thing, one of the first things we did was bring a supermarket into yeah. the community. The, the restoration did, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it is difficult in many places. It, it I think the, the one thing I'll just add to what Pat was saying, is I, it needs to be a multi-pronged strategy. So a supermarket is one piece of it, right. but um, there are lots of other ways to get. Uh, I want to give a, one credit. Perry Winston, who unfortunately is no longer with us, was a member of the Pratt Center staff and he worked with the residents of East New York to launch one of the first farms, community farms. It still exists today and it's vi being visited by many others. He, when did he do it, Aisha? I thought I saw you here. It was in, I think it was in the, in the, in the 70s, right? Late 70s or 80s. And, and I think that's one way. Uh, we have to begin to think about using our rooftops and some of our streets. There's a guy in Spain who basically is planting fruit trees in all his new town development so that you can actually can grow, you can have linear farms as well. Maybe a little less parking and a little more linear farms. Much more <laughs> planting and less parking. Be a bad thing. Can you expand on the role of zoning, rezoning decisions, or availability of affordable housing, unavailable affordable affordable housing, how Bloomberg administration gave away um, something rights, sorry, with no, it's not air rights, but someone wrote this out there. Development rights, thank you, it was abbreviated. Gave away development rights with um, no give back, for example, um, inclusionary zoning. Okay, who wants to run with that? Yeah, because I'm a zoning expert, not really. <laughs> um, <laughs> Bloomberg was against mandatory inclusionary zoning, um, which, which requires developers who get increased um, density to set aside a percentage of their, of their, of their units that they're developing for affordable um, housing the affordability by definition, and so, it, you know, there's some contention, of course, in New York, this being New York, um, about what affordability means and the tranches of affordability are, are always movable. But um, Bloomberg was against that being mandatory, and what de Blasio did was he made it mandatory. So it was that, you know, it was that, that switch that, um, I, I guess you could say that Bloomberg gave away development rights, but in, in effect, there were some inclusionary zoning projects in New York City, they just weren't, it wasn't mandatory, it was an optional piece that developers were able to, to assume. 
1983, the Pratt Center, working with Paul Davidoff and others in New York City, proposed an inclusionary housing program. The intent of that inclusionary housing program was to bring about integration in many of our neighborhoods, economic and racial integration. Today, it has become a, a mechanism for financing housing. And when you make it a mechanism for financing housing, it's a gentrification program. Excuse me for using the term. Because what you're doing is you're requiring 80 to 70 to 80 percent of the units to be high income, not middle income, in order to have 20 percent low income. And so what we need to do is begin to th finance affordable housing rather than require it by skewing the rents in the building. So where does that financing come from? So what's happening is a lot of this rezoning is sort of a Trojan horse for changing neighborhoods rather than for maintaining the population there and introducing higher income families. But where will the financing come from? Is well, we've got to start it? paying for it. And those of the folks who know me know I have a mechanism for that that I get laughed at. And that is, until Koch was mayor, uh, his mayorality, we had a stock transfer tax. That tax exists today. That tax exists today. It's collected every day, but rebated to the financial companies. That's $12 billion a year. And if we took that money, or even a portion of it, and dedicated it to affordable housing, dedicated some of it to mass transportation and to public housing, we'd be a much better city for all our residents. Uh, I mean, Ron has a point, but I will say that um, almost all the affordable units that have been built in Bed-Stuy in the last 10 years have been a function either of voluntary inclusionary zoning or mandatory inclusionary zoning. And if it weren't for that, it would wouldn't be. Wouldn't happen. No. And, and I would just, uh, let me just say too, Ron, that I think we shouldn't fall into the trap of thinking that it's this solution and not that one, or this solution and none of the others. I think there's room for sort of multiple solutions. And, and to some extent, I think that we have to admit and acknowledge that we gotta, we gotta use whatever tools we can to get the private market, right, to be part of the solution. They're not gonna, they're not gonna be all of the solution, but let's try and use some tools that are available to make them to be at least part of the solution. Well, I, I, I'm not opposed to that. But I want to, when I'm in a public position, to advocate for what I ultimately believe, all right? And I believe we really should be financing this housing. Uh, we should sweeten it for the private developers so they're providing more low, moderate, and middle-income housing, that we really need to have a mandatory inclusionary housing program rather than a an optional one, and it should not be based only on selling sky. It really should be based on what the capacity of the zoning in that area can provide in a healthy and reasonable way. Yeah, I just one other point about the recent history around rezonings is, um, you know, I think there's, I think a general consensus that the rezoning, the first ones out, uh, the, the de Blasio administration, um, you know, pursued in terms of um, re targeted neighborhoods were all lower income, black and brown neighborhoods that were at risk of exactly what we've been talking about, um, that kind of um, rise in prices because of that development. So um, there is a an effort now to look at whiter, wealthier neighborhoods and rezone them for more housing because New York City needs more housing. I think that is, again, that requires huge political fights but again, that's what it's going to take, and uh, we need the housing. And so, so, right, but if that, so you saw what happened in Soho, I mean, which was passed eventually at the end of the administration, but with enormous local resistance, and uh, it came up against all the arguments we hear now about historic I, preservation. I think what I'm going to push back on is that you're raising the fact that it was a big fight, uh -huh. and see, I, what I'm saying Except is that. that's what that's it's going to it take. Is. <laughs> right. You enough. know, that's part of the process that right. with anything, with any, and, and so right. we can't look at, well, there was a fight over it, so therefore maybe the strategy isn't working. Well, it, it, there's always going to be a mediation of interests, and it, it might not always come out where you want it to. We live in a very transactional world now, 
And, um, and I think that people on both sides of an issue have to see what's in it for them. I just personally believe that we have to refine the argument that economically and racially diverse communities make the city stronger. Yeah. Right, and we have to find a way to communicate that. So, because because everything that's being said here is correct, um, we have one of the most what is the third most segregated school system in, in the United States, right here in the most one of, a city that touts itself as being one of the most the most segregated state in the United States, and we consider ourselves the most right. progressive, or one among the most progressive. So I think we have to, I just don't know that we've found a way to articulate the benefits on both sides, but I think long term, when we think about human development, and that's what I think about all the time, is I think less about housing and less about, I think about all these things as vehicles for human development, right? And we have enormous talent in this city that is going to waste because it is not properly educated, not properly housed, et cetera, et cetera. And I believe you know, that there is abundance in us coming together to make sure that we use every vehicle we have, whether it's housing or entrepreneurship, et cetera, in bringing out the best in all of us. One last question, because we don't have a lot of time, unless, unless we do have a little more time. I was told we don't. Um, and I'll bring it back to um, the archive, Ron, which was, Karen Kuby asked, what are your dreams for how this archive gets used? Wow. Oh, first of all, I hope it gets used. <laughs> uh, but uh, one of the things I think that really is important is to look back at history in order to see what was tried, what were the processes that people were engaged in, and leapfrog from today to tomorrow so that we could re begin to use some of what we learned over that period of time in a way to address the challenges of tomorrow. And the point that Colvin just made, how do we really build a multiracial, multicultural democracy, I think is fundamental to everything we've been talking about. I had the unique opportunity uh, you know, to meet uh, some folks at the Center for Community Change early on in Washington when we were working, who began to open up those horizons for me. And that was something I shared with the communities and with, my, with the staff. And I think it really was really important to begin to think about those things. One of the contacts was a guy by the name of George Wiley. George Wiley was in the, uh, one of the individuals who played a great role in nurturing the community organizing in the country, the welfare rights movement, which you work with Fran Pivot and others uh, around. He also was the father of Maya Wiley. And Maya Wiley, uh, who then came to us at the, came to me at the Pratt Center and Rudy Bryant and said she had, had this idea of an organization. And we worked with her and she formed something called the Center for Social Inclusion. That today is known as Race Forward in the country. It's one of the largest groups addressing uh, you know, issues of racial democracy in this country. And I had the fortunate role of being on her board and continue to be on that board. And th these are things that fell into our laps, but it really is something that we have to look at. How do we look at that organizing tree? George Wiley also worked with Gary Delgado, the guy who launched ACORN, uh, people who launched groups like uh, Make the Road, uh, that are keeping working for immigrants coming into the country, that are looking at what are the challenges in the welfare, in the environmental justice movements. 3,000 or more units of public housing will be lost to flooding. We can't build 3,000 units overnight. We have to start thinking about those issues. So I'm hoping that people will look at that archive and really begin to see that it's, uh, it's a whole set of, it's a fabric woven together from a variety of disconnected threads. And I think that's the important, that they're really interconnected threads. And I think that's the important lesson here. And, and that it takes a movement, not individuals, and not one organization, but a whole set of organizations working together to bring about that change.
Uh, thank you, Ron, and thank you, Evan, thank you, Pat, and thank you, Colvin. Um, and again, Ron, congratulations, and hopefully people will, just as you say, look back through the archives in order to figure ways forward. That's, that's the best we can hope. Um, and thank you all for being here, um, and uh, welcome to the real world again. <laughs>